Hello, everybody. I'm Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Life, pastor of Saddleback Church, and teacher on the Daily Hope broadcast. And I want to welcome you to this special series of encouraging messages that I'm sharing with you each week during the global coronavirus pandemic. You know, in normal times, about 30,000 people attend the church I pastor, Saddleback Church, uh, each weekend to worship and hear my messages. But with the shutdown of public gatherings due to the coronavirus, I've been sharing these messages of hope through a number of different channels. And the first two messages in this series have now been heard literally by millions of people around the world because they have been used by radio and television stations in many countries and others are posting these messages on the social media and on YouTube and many, many other channels. So let me just say right here at the start that I give you permission to rebroadcast these messages freely anywhere during this coronavirus crisis because we wanna give help and hope and encouragement to as many people as possible. Now this coronavirus uh, crisis that we're all going through right now is unprecedented. It has turned our lives upside down. And many things that people have taken for granted and depended on are not available now. Uh, events have been canceled and businesses and schools and churches have all been closed for the foreseeable future. We, we've been told that the best way to shorten this pandemic is actually to stay at home. And as this crisis extends longer and, and longer on, and goes all around the world, people are feeling the economic stress and the strain on their finances. Uh, this last week, millions of people were put out of work with no income and no idea about when they might be able to go back to work and make that income. Now, how should you react to circumstances that are beyond your control? I mean, what should you depend on when the things you have depended on are taken away from you? In other words, what do you do when life stops working the way you expected it to work? These, these are legitimate questions, and they're important questions that everybody's asking these days. And, and that's why two weeks ago, I started this special series of messages that I'm calling A Faith That Works When Life Doesn't. A Faith That Works When Life Doesn't. You see, a, a faith that doesn't work when life doesn't work is worthless. I mean, that kind of faith is of no use to anybody. But I want to help you discover a deeper faith, a faith that lasts, a practical faith that will help you through tough times, a faith that will give you hope and purpose and significance and, and meaning, and yes, even happiness in the middle of a crisis. That's the kind of faith we all need these days. And I call it a faith that works when life doesn't. Because honestly, and you know this from experience, life doesn't always work out the way you want it to. Now, you can go back and watch the first two messages in this series uh, if you've missed them. The first message was called Walking Without Fear Through the Valley of Virus. You know, one of the best known parts of the Bible is Psalm 23. And in that Psalm, David confidently says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear nothing. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So in that first message, I, I shared and talked about seven truths that you need to remember while we're going through this valley of virus, this crisis, this global pandemic. You need to know those seven truths that'll give you confidence and courage and defeat your fears and anxieties. Then last week, the second message, which I shared, is also available online at saddleback.com slash watch. And it's called A Faith That Handles Difficulties. And I, in that message, explain uh, three purposes of problems in your life and four ways to get the most out of them. Now this week, I want us to look at a faith that makes tough choices easier. A faith that makes tough choices easier. Because you're gonna have to make some tough choices in the days ahead. 
but first, uh, let me explain before we get into that, what I call the seven typical ways that people react to a crisis. And, and I hope you'll write these down. There, there's actually an outline you can do this, but I want you to write these down so you can recognize them in yourself and others. They're actually stages. And you may go through every one of them. My goal is to get you to stage seven. But if you understand these uh, uh, stages, you're going to find uh, that you're a lot more patient with yourself and with other people. So, by the way, with every message that I, I, I share here online, uh, I post a, uh, a, a teaching outline, a fill-in outline, uh, that you can go to at saddleback.com slash watch. So if you're watching this as a video, you might want to pause it right now and download that outline or at least pull it up on your phone. That way you can follow along and take notes. So here are the seven typical uh, ways uh, that people uh, deal with a crisis, okay? Their reactions to a crisis. And we go through these stages. The first phase is denial. And you've seen this in people. There were people going, uh, this is not my problem. This coronavirus problem, that's in some other country. It may not even be real. That's phase one, denial. A phase two is what I call dismissal. And at that point, you move from denial, going, it may not even be real, to, okay, it's real, but it's no big deal. And uh, this is going to end fast and it won't last. It'll end fast and won't last. That's the dismissal phase. But then eventually, uh, people are getting to the third phase, which is defiance, which is, you know, I know they're telling us to do these things, but I refuse to let this limit my freedom. I'm not going to let it cramp or crimp my style. I'm healthy, and I'm not going to stay at home alone or whatever. I, I, I'm going to not let this limit me. That's defiance. But eventually, as we have seen over time, you get to stage four, which is delayed acceptance. And that's where a lot of people got this week, which was, okay, it is a big deal and it will affect me. Then you get to stage five, and that is disruption. And almost everybody in the world is now at this phase, which, which is my life just turned upside down. And in disruption, you start saying, I'm going to have to make some tough choices. The kids are out of school. I'm out of work. I've got financial choices to make, relational choices to make. I've got priority choices to make. And, and it, my whole life has been disrupted. Then you get to stage, stage or phase six, which is distress. And that's when it slowly dawns on you, this is going to last a long time. And this is going to change everything. This pandemic is not going to be over in a week. It's not going to be over in a month. It's going to last a long time. We've never had this kind of uh, turnover pandemic globally in our lifetime. It's going to change everything. That causes a lot of distress, a lot of stress in people's lives. My goal in these messages is to get you to stage seven, which is determination. And in determination, you say, you know, with God's grace, we're going to get through this together. With God's grace, we will make it. We are determined to go through it together. And if you'll check in with me every week, we're going to do that together. Now, today we're going to talk about decisions. Because life is a series of choices and decisions. Every day you have to analyze, you have to evaluate, you have to draw conclusions. We make our choices, and then our choices make us. How does trusting God make tough choices easier? Well, James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, tells us how, and that's what we're going to look at in just a second. But before I share how trusting God will make the tough choices in your life that you're going to have to make this week, will make them easier. I, I want to do two things. First, let me define what I mean by a tough choice. A tough choice isn't necessarily a significant choice. You can have a tough choice deciding what to wear or what to eat. A tough choice means none of the options 
is obviously more favorable than the other. That's what a tough choice is. You may have to decide between two good things and they're both equally good, or you may have to decide between two bad things and they're equally bad, or you may have to decide between two painful things and they're equally painful. That's when you have to make a tough choice. And that's what I want us to look at God's word today. Two options that could be equally good or equally bad or equally uh, unfavorable or equally painful. Now, in those kind of situations where you can't find an obvious uh, advantage to one or the other, since you can't decide, you might just think, well, I'll just flip a coin. Please don't do that because that is abdicating your power to choose to a game of chance. You don't want to do that. Don't do that. Your ability to choose, your free will, your ability to make decisions is one of God's greatest gifts to you. It's what makes you human. Animals, worms don't get to decide. They just live by instincts. Birds don't get to make moral choices. But you do because you're made in God's image. So you don't want to turn that over to just chance of flipping a coin. You want to know how to make tough choices. Second thing, before we look at the solutions, I want you to try to think of something specific that you're going to face this week. Maybe you need to make it right now. A tough choice you got to make about your finances because you're out of work. Am I going to pay my rent? You know, am I going to pay my mortgage? It's coming up in a week and I'm out of work. Uh, a choice with your kids, they're at home. How, how, you're having a hard time deciding what to do. How will trusting God make that decision easier? Well, here's what the Bible says. Write these down. Number one, first, when I trust God, he gives me his wisdom. When I trust God, he gives me his wisdom. And that's what I need when I have to make one of those tough choices where there's no clear uh, you know, uh, advantage to one or the other. James chapter one, verse five says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should pray. You should pray and ask God because he gives it generously to anyone who asks. He never resents your asking. God loves to help you and he'll give you the wisdom you need. Just ask. You know, the reason we don't have God's wisdom is we simply don't ask for it. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. You haven't got it because you haven't asked for it. Why should I want wisdom? Well, if you read through the book of Proverbs, it'll give you about 30 practical benefits of wisdom. But let me just give you one. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18 says this. Those who become wise will be happy. Wisdom is the key to a blessed life. Do you want to be happy? Do you want your life to be blessed? Then the Bible says you're going to need wisdom. You're going to need God's wisdom in your life. And God's wisdom is the opposite of the world's wisdom. He says wisdom is the key to happiness and wisdom is the key to being blessed. Proverbs 4 verse 7 says this, getting wisdom is the most important thing you can get in life. Wow. It's more important than money. It's more important than fame. It's more important than pleasure. It's more important than success. In fact, wisdom brings all those other things into your life. He says, if you're going to focus on getting one thing, get wisdom. In the days ahead, while you're out of work, while you're at home, if you will use these days to get wisdom, when you go back to work eventually, you're going to be wiser. You'll be blessed. You'll be happier. You'll be smarter. The Bible says that we need wisdom in our lives. You see, because we're human, we're all imperfect. That means the possibility for error in our choices is very high. And how many times have you made the wrong decision? You paid too much for something. You gave up too soon. You waited too long. You said the wrong thing. You know, so much hurt, so much pain in our lives comes from foolish decisions, bad choices. That's why we need wisdom. Proverbs 24, 14 says this, wisdom is good for the soul. 
And if you get wisdom, you'll have a bright and secure future. Now, right now, the future doesn't look so bright. It doesn't look so secure. But the Bible says if you get wisdom, you're going to have a bright and you're going to have a secure future. So the first thing I need to do is trust God, because when I trust God, he'll give me his wisdom. How do I get the wisdom I need? Well, the Bible gives us three ways. You might write these down. Three ways we get wisdom in life. First, the first way I get wisdom is to put God first in my life. That's the way I'm going to get wisdom. Number one is to just put God first in my life. Make him the top priority in my thoughts, in my life, in my schedule, in my money, in my relationships. I put God first in my life. Psalm 111 verse 10 says this, reverence for the Lord is the foundation of all true wisdom. The rewards of wisdom, did you know there are rewards of wisdom? There are those other things, uh, power and and the prestige, a good reputation, uh, a success. The rewards of wisdom are given to anyone who listens and obeys God. Now he says, what is reverence gives for God gives you wisdom? What's reverence? Reverence means to honor. It means to respect. It means to give priority to. It means you trust God. When you trust God, God says, I will give you my wisdom. God doesn't just give wisdom to everybody. He gives it to everybody who asks and who trusts. Proverbs 15, says this, honoring God and being humble leads to wisdom and wisdom will bring honor to you. Now notice, when you honor God, it gives you wisdom. And when you're humble, it gives you wisdom. And when you get wisdom, then other people honor you. <laughs> the more humble you are, the more you're going to depend on God's wisdom in this coronavirus crisis. So be humble or you'll stumble. Remember the lesson of the whale. When you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when they harpoon you. And instead of uh, trying to depend on your own wisdom, you depend on God's wisdom. You're humble and you're dependent. You're going to make fewer mistakes. So the first step is to put God first in my life. That's going to give me wisdom. Number two, the Bible says the second key to wisdom is to practice God's word in my life. Not just put God first, but practice his word in my life. Now, this Bible, this book is filled with wisdom. But you don't get wisdom simply by reading the Bible. You get God's wisdom by applying the Bible, by implementing the Bible, by doing what God says to do. In John 13, 17, Jesus said this, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you, notice, do them. Listen, if you do them, you're not, you're not blessed by simply knowing the Bible. A lot of people know the Bible and aren't blessed by it. You're blessed if you do it. Now, I've said many times and for years, the only parts of the Bible that we actually truly believe are the parts that we practice. The parts that we practice. You say, well, I believe we should do this. Do you do it? No, then you don't really believe it. We only believe the parts of the Bible that we actually practice. The Bible says, I should put God first and I should practice God's word. Why should I practice what God tells me to do? 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31 says this, God's way is always perfect and God's word is always true. God's way is always perfect and God's word is always true. If I do it his way and I follow his word, I'm going to do the right thing at the right time. It'll always be the right thing to do. When I have a difficult decision to make, I need to remember that God's way is perfect and God's word is true. So I want to go to God's word and I want to see, does God say anything about this decision? God's way is perfect. God's word is true. Here's what the Bible says in the book of James, chapter 1, down in verse 25. If you look intently, that's another word for study. If you look intently into God's perfect word, it gives you freedom. The more I 
read and study God's word, the more free I'll be. If you look intently into God's perfect word that gives you freedom and you continue to do so, in other words, you make it a habit, the habit of daily Bible reading, daily Bible study, daily listening to the word of God, and you continue to do this, not forgetting what you've learned. In other words, you try to remember. You might even write some verses down on cards and remember them, not forgetting what you've learned. And then you put it into practice in your life. God promises this. You will be blessed in everything you do. Coronavirus or not, you know, held hostage in your home or not, you will be blessed in everything you do if you study the word, you remember the word, you practice the word, you put it into practice in your life, you'll be blessed in everything you do. So how do I get God's wisdom? See, then I, when I can make a tough decision, I can either make it on my wisdom or I can make it on God's wisdom. If I make it on God's wisdom, first I, 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 I put God first in my life, and second, I practice God's word in my life. Now, there's a third source of wisdom to make wise decisions. Write this down. I not only put God first, practice his word, I get some godly people in my life. Get some godly people into my life. Not only do I want to have God's word in my life, I want to have people in my life who also know God's word. The people you hang out with the most right now are either helping you or hurting you. They're either building your fear or they're building your faith. They're either making you more cowardly or more courageous. They're either causing you to worry or you're causing you to worship. Uh, they're either stress generators in your life or they're stress relievers in your life. The quality of your life and the quality of your decisions and the quality of your choices will be determined by who you spend the most time with. So you need to choose your friends wisely. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says this, if you keep company with wise people, you'll become wise. But if you hang out with foolish people, you'll suffer from making bad choices because they make bad choices. Now, I realize that with so many of us being told to stay at home in our houses, this may seem like a difficult thing to do. How do I get with godly people? But actually, the opposite is true. We now have all kinds of free technology like Zoom and Skype and FaceTime and Microsoft Team and a lot of others, countless other connection platforms where you can hang out with godly people, shoot, on the other side of the world and still be at home. How do I know this? I've been doing it all week. In fact, in the last month where I've been at home much of that time, uh, I have interacted with more people than I could have ever met with face to face. I have been doing Zoom calls with my staff and Zoom calls with members and Zoom calls with my small group and Zoom calls with my kids and Zoom calls with my grandkids and everybody else. I, I have a meet with my elders once or twice a day. And uh, it's that social distancing rule is there. But, but you can do this. Just learn a simple technology and don't just sit at home binging on Netflix or old movies. Uh, spend some time with godly people. Set up a regular call because when you do that, you'll gain wisdom. Trusting God uh, to, uh, makes tough choices easier. Why? Because he gives me wisdom when I ask for it. How does he give it wisdom? When I put him first, when I practice his word, when I spend time with other people who know his word, godly people. He gives me wisdom when I ask for it. But there's another way God helps you make difficult decisions. When I trust God, he frees me from second guessing. Write this down. When I trust God, he frees me from second guessing. Now, you know what I'm talking about. You've got a tough, difficult, rough choice to make. 
And you, you can't decide which way. This way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way. And finally, you make a tough choice. And then the moment you make the choice, you start doubting yourself. You start guessing yourself, uh, second guessing. You agonize it over it. You know, Did I do the right thing? Did I do the right thing? Few things will make you more miserable in life than second guessing yourself. And some of you are pros at it. It, it, it can be self-inflicted torture. Some of you are really, really good at torturing yourself with self-doubt and with second guessing yourself. But God says, this is dumb. And this is why he wants you to trust him. Because when you trust him, you're not, he sets you free from second guessing yourself. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24 says this, anyone with God's wisdom will know what makes good sense. Okay, you're gonna know. But foolish people can never make up their minds. Why am I trying to make up, I can't make up my mind? Because I'm depending on my wisdom. I'm not depending on God's wisdom. I'm not in the word. I'm not with godly people. He isn't first in my life. But James 1, 6 to 8 talks about when you ask God for wisdom, you can't be double-minded. James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8 says this. When you ask God for wisdom, you must believe and expect God to answer. Because anyone who starts doubting is like a wave in the sea that's blown and tossed around by the ever-changing winds. Let me stop right there for a minute. We are in a season of ever-changing winds. With this coronavirus, the winds change sometimes by the hour. We're now doing it this way. No, we're doing it that way. Now this is the problem. No, this is the problem. And in the, in the days and the months ahead, things are going to be changing sometimes by the hour. You don't want to be tossed back and forth like a wave by the ever-changing winds. He says, don't, don't, don't be double-minded. He says, because if you do that, you won't get God's wisdom if you're double-minded, where you're always wavering back and forth. That only makes you unstable and insecure in everything you do. When you're double-minded, when you second-guess yourself, when you doubt yourself, it makes you unstable in everything you do. Now, that word double-minded in Greek in the Bible literally means two-souled. It means two-souled. You're pulled in opposite directions. You have divided loyalties. You're, you're ambivalent. You're, you're vacillating back and forth. You ever feel like that? You're not sure what to do? Well, that kind of indecision, that double-mindedness, that self-doubt, that causes instability. Second-guessing creates unstable emotions, and second-guessing creates unstable relationships. <laughs> you know, I remember hearing about a psychologist who asked a client, are you indecisive? And the person said, well, yes and no. He said, I, I, I used to be, but now I'm not sure. <laughs> It, it not only creates instability, instability in your emotions and in your relationships, double-mindedness creates an unstable spiritual life. It blocks your prayers. Look at that verse again. It says, don't expect to receive anything from God if you're doubting and double-minded. It blocks your prayers. Being un, uh, uh, indecisive keeps us from receiving what God wants to give us. Okay, so let's review. When I have a tough decision to make, trusting God makes tough choices easier. First, because he gives me his wisdom when I ask for it. And second, he frees me from self-doubt and second-guessing when I trust in him. Number three, here's the third benefit. When I trust God, he acts on my behalf. When I trust God, God acts. He moves into action. He moves mountains on my behalf. See, God is not moved by our whining, our complaining, our griping. But God moves into action. He moves mountains. He moves blockades. He moves barriers in our lives when we trust him. Trusting God moves God into action. And I mentioned this earlier. Some of you got rent or mortgage 
do in the next week or two. A and you're out of work. You've got a really tough choice to make. You know, Jesus said this in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. According to your faith, it will be done. God says, you get to choose how much I bless your life. You have big faith, you get big blessing. Little faith, little blessing. No faith, no blessing. According to your faith, you get to choose how much I bless you, even in the middle of this coronavirus. How much will you trust me for? God says, when I trust God, he moves into action. Let me give you one more. Number four, this is a big encouragement. When you have to make a tough decision about your job, about your kids, uh, about where you live, uh, any kind of major decision or minor one is just tough. When I trust God, this is number four, when I trust God, he uses even my mistakes. He uses even my mistakes. What am I saying? I'm saying when I trust God, even if I make the wrong decision, God will still bring good out of it. I can't lose. That makes the stress level go down dramatically. When I have a tough decision to make, and I don't know, do I choose this or do I choose this? They're equally good. They're equally bad. They're equally painful. I don't know. But when I make the decision in faith and I make the decision trusting God, God says this in Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes everything. That's even my mistakes. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those of us who love him and are called to live his purpose for us. If you love God and you really want his purpose for your life, you can't miss God's will. Even if you make a wrong decision, God says, that's okay. I'll bring good out of it. I'll, I'll fit it into the plan. I'll use it for good. You can relax. That's an amazing thing to remember when you have a tough decision to make. They're both equally bad. They're both equally good. They're both equally painful. God says, if I trust him, he will use even my mistakes, even if I choose the wrong thing, but I'm doing it in faith. I'm doing it with a good conscience. I'm doing it trying to honor God. God says, I will use this for good in your life. That ought to help you relax because you can't, God, God says, I'm your safety net. Even if you happen to choose the wrong thing or not the second of the, of the two things, I'll still use it for good in your life. That's not a promise for everybody. It's a promise for those who love God and who are trying to live by his purpose. You know, I'd like to pray for you uh, right now. And then I'd like to talk to you about some next steps that you can practice this week. Would you bow your head? I, I want you to think of a difficult decision you're facing right now. And I want you to give it to God. And then I want you to pray this prayer. Say, dear God, I want to trust you with my life. I want to trust you with my life by putting you first in my life. I want to trust you to give me the wisdom I need because I'm asking for it. Help me to get into your word and to learn your word and to practice it and to find out what you say about life. I'm going to trust you to bring good friends into my life who are godly. Help me to stop hanging out with people who tear down my faith, who, who build up my fear, and to spend more time this week, even if it's on Skype or Zoom, or to start a relationship with somebody who's wise because they know your word. I'm asking you to help me have your wisdom through your word and through your people and through your circumstances of life. Guide me and direct me. Help me to make wise decisions. And then, Lord, I'm asking you to, to help me to trust you in every little area, knowing that I don't have to second guess myself, that you will give me 
with your with faith the power to stop torturing myself over decisions because i know that even if i made a second best decision you're going to bring good out of it thank you for that comfort thank you for that assurance thank you that you work all things together for good in my life with their heads still bowed if you've never invited jesus christ into your life god wants to give you more than wisdom he wants to give you his salvation he wants to give you a personal relationship he wants to become your friend so would you say in your heart dear jesus christ i don't understand it all but i want a friendship with you i want a relationship with god I know I'm not God. I know I've made a lot of mistakes and I need your forgiveness, but I'm turning my life over to you. The good, the bad, the ugly, every part of it. I, I want the rest of my life to be the best of my life. And I want to learn to love you and trust you. And I'm opening my life to you, Jesus Christ. I'm saying as best as I can say, as humbly as I can say it, yes to you today. And I ask you to give me your spirit and your forgiveness and your salvation. I humbly ask this in your name. Amen. Now, if you just finished, prayed that prayer for the very first time, that's an amazing uh, thing to do. And you need to tell somebody about it. I hope you'll tell me about it. Uh, here's some next steps that we do every week at Saddleback Church. Now, since we're not meeting, we can't do them together, but we can do these online together. The first thing we do every week at the end of each service is we recommit our lives to Jesus Christ. That's what we just did in that prayer. Maybe you did it for the very first time. If you did, would you tell me about your decision? Write to me, Pastor Rick at Saddleback.com. Pastor Rick at Saddleback.com. Say, Rick, I prayed that prayer and I gave my life to Christ or whatever prayer request you have, please tell me. I'll pray for you. Part of my job as a pastor is to pray for people. And if you write to me, we'll get your request and we'll pray for you. If you have invited your life, uh, Christ into your life, I'll send you some material that will help you understand your decision. Congratulations. Now, the second thing we do every week at Saddleback is we express our gratitude to God through our giving. We give back to God because everything he's given us is a gift. And the Bible says that we're to give a portion of what we've been given back to him in gratitude and in faith that he's going to take care of us. Do you trust God enough to give something back to him? If so, I want to encourage you to go to saddleback.com forward slash give. You can give online. You can give online. And if you don't like to give online, there's an address there that you can mail in a gift. Let me just say this. When you give to Saddleback Church, your gifts right now are literally helping hundreds of thousands of people. We have fed thousands of people during this crisis already. We have distributed uh, packs to people who need it. We are visiting the most vulnerable. We are caring for people all around the world because Saddleback Church isn't just one church. It's in 20 locations on four different continents. We have a Saddleback Hong Kong helping people in China. We have a Saddleback Berlin helping people in Europe. We have a Saddleback uh, Buenos Aires helping people in Latin America. We have a Saddleback uh, Manila helping people in East Asia and the Philippines in that area. And when you give to Saddleback, you're giving to promote reconciliation around the world, to equip leaders around the world, to assist the poor, to care for the sick, to educate the next generation. Just this week, somebody sent in a check for $200,000 to help spread the Daily Hope broadcast so we could take this message to more places around the world, giving people hope during this coronavirus pandemic. Wherever you want to help out, you can give uh, online through saddleback.com. The third thing we do every week is we discuss what we learn with a group of friends. If you're not in a small group, can I help you get in a small group? You say, well, I can't even allowed to meet in a group. That's okay. You can meet virtually 
through a Skype group or a, 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 a Zoom group. At Saddleback Church, when we started this year, we had 6,000 small groups that were meeting in homes every week. Since this virus has started, we have started over 3,000 new groups. Did you hear me? Since we started this, the, this crisis, we've started over 3,000 new groups. We have over 9,000 groups spread out all around. Well, they're not meeting together in homes these days, but they're now meeting online. And you need that encouragement. Let us help you get a group of friends. Go to saddleback.com, connect small groups. All right? And the fourth thing that we do is we stay connected to help each other and to help others in this crisis. And if you'd like to help out others, if you'd like to volunteer at Saddleback Church, over 60,000 people have volunteered in the past 40 years to serve overseas in 197 countries and here in America. About 30,000 have served in 197 countries and another 30,000 have served here in America. We need your help. If you'd like to help with this crisis, go to saddleback.com corona response and there's a place that you can involve. We want to care for the sick. We want to protect the vulnerable. We want to serve our communities and we want to mobilize the healthy. And if you're healthy, we could use your help. Now, again, I gave you permission to post this message or parts of it online anywhere. You can uh, uh, tell other people through social media. You can pass it on to radio stations or TV stations. Freely distribute this. We're just trying to help people be as encouraged as they possibly can. Next week, we're going to...
at how real faith, a faith that works, helps us when we are distracted and when we're tempted and when we can't seem to break bad habits in our lives. That's going to be an important message. I hope you'll join me for all 14 messages in this series. God bless you. And if you want to write to me, write to Pastor Rick at Saddleback.com. God bless you.